Welcome to Steal This Show, the podcast that investigates all that's new in file sharing, the future of media, and distribution on the edge. Hosted by me, Jamie King, and presented by Torrent Freak. In this show, we're chatting with Devin Reed and Ryan Taylor from the Distributed Library of Alexandria, a truly promising development in the peer-to-peer world. First, some select comments from our listener reviews on iTunes. Here's two four-star reviews, the first from Scandalous Savage, who says, Great podcast, host and guest are very insightful. Could be a bit longer. Thanks, Scandalous. We'll be experimenting with various formats for the show, so anything's possible. Appreciate the feedback. The second four-star rating is from Baloche, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who says, The idea of copyright is much more than just a debate. It is the future of freedom of the internet, and we must fight in every way to keep the internet free. Baloche, thanks for your comment, and I think you'll be very interested to hear from our guests this week, who very much share your viewpoint. If you enjoy this episode, leaving a rating or review on iTunes is a great way to support us and very much appreciated. I'll make sure to read out some more of your comments next time. But without further ado, Devon, thanks for being on the show. You're a former Hollywood visual effects artist and Apple creative and you're CEO and co-founder of the Distributed Library of Alexandria project. Is that right? Yes, sir. Anything you'd like to add to that? There was one other kind of significant life experience, and that was being a Marine. I bring it up just because it's kind of the second half to why this project is important to me. Ryan, you're the front-end developer for Alexandria Project. You've been an enthusiast in the world of peer-to-peer for some time. You're interested in both the technology and the communities that grow up around peer-to-peer projects. Can you tell us a bit more about what you've been doing with BlockTech and Alexandria, and maybe a little bit about what you've been doing before this? I got involved with Alexandria at the very beginning. Devin came to me after we kind of connected in an Ethereum chat group. I was working with Mihai and Vitalik on Ethereum. I was previously the webmaster for Bitcoin Magazine for about two and a half years. I've been involved in the the sharing and peer-to-peer communication space for virtually my whole life. So just before we move on to the news items, what is the Distributed Library of Alexandria in no more than two sentences? Peer-to-peer file sharing with a distributed, unchangeable index plus payments. Up this week, we have three stories. The first is about the Amazon Fire TV stick, which is being used in the UK and presumably all around the world to install apps which allow streaming of all kinds of media not sold by Amazon, not part of the Amazon Prime TV offering. The second is about the screener leaking group Hive CM8, which has issued a kind of corporate apology for leaking Tarantino's Hateful Eight DVD Oscar screener. And the third is about a cracking group which is warning that there will be no more pirated games available in two years because DRM technology is getting too good for them. So coming to the first story, did pirates clean out the Amazon Fire TV stock in the UK. Apparently the Fire Stick is currently out of stock in all the largest stores in the UK and the idea here is that Kodi an app which offers access to all the latest movies and TV shows and live sports for free is being installed on these Fire TV sticks because they're essentially Android based devices and being sold as a kind of home piracy device for the living room. There's a few people set up on eBay selling preloaded Fire TV sticks with Kodi with all the right plugins so that you just plug it into your TV. I guess it's essentially like popcorn time for your TV. This is a pretty unforeseen use of Amazon's technology. Devin, what are your thoughts on this? Solutions like this or even like popcorn time, really, I think what they suggest to us is that it's just about giving people the content they want in one place. They keep on trying to act like the people who do these things are the enemies of content creators, but in fact, they're the biggest supporters and biggest fans of content. And they're just trying to get over the walls that the industry has built and get to their content. And they'll always find a way. It's a pretty thorny problem, though, because on the one hand, you want to say, well, if Prime TV or Netflix or some combination of reasonably priced monthly subscription services could give you access to the vast majority of films that are out there, you'd pay for it and you wouldn't 
be pirating anymore. But actually, what we discussed last week with a couple of experts and an MPAA guy was that it's impossible for copyright owners, the media industry as it exists, to offer all of its content in a stable way to all of the subscription platforms. Do you have a take on that, Ryan? The innovation is genius. It's just wonderful. The fact that this gets out on the market and immediately gets turned into something that satisfy needs, which they hadn't even comprehended. They always look the other way about the strict definition of copyright if it enables them to get some money and no one's like suing them specifically for it. So until someone sues Amazon because they're looking the other way, they're going to continue to look the other way because they make money on the hardware sale. Is it possible to imagine that companies could actually take control of a product like Amazon Fire TV? Is, is it just the future of devices like this, that they're hackable, they're going to be reappropriated? Is that just the nature of this type of technology? Yeah, if they're going to be using open source tech like Android, then people are going to apply other open source tech on top of it. And even like look at Apple, the most closed proprietary system in, in the world is they always jailbreak the iPhone as soon as they can. Is it just the same as routers that you have in your house, Wi-Fi devices, they're all hackable? That's actually kind of an interesting question because the Federal Communications Commission in the U.S. has recently come out with statements threatening to make it illegal to actually hack your routers or wireless devices. They say that it's for your own protection, of course. They want to protect certain frequencies and, and whatnot. But really, they're trying to make it a crime out of doing this sort of thing to our communications technology. One of the things that interests me is the illegibility of these kinds of devices in people's homes. You know, you were never supposed to know how your TV worked. And you didn't need to know because someone else was taking care of all that hardware. The media establishment is in a tricky position because you may have millions of people in the UK buying devices from eBay that are hacked Amazon Prime sticks with no clue whatsoever of what they're doing, of how it works. Presumably, it's a BitTorrent plugin that works very similarly to Popcorn Time, and they're opening themselves to all sorts of lawsuits and so on. There's no reasonable expectation that any of them would know how this works. It's difficult to paint them as black pirates when they're just buying something off the internet. Exactly. We've seen for, for the last X number of years, the term is always just pirate and bad guy. And like anyone who's doing these things is the enemy of the content creators. And to me, it's like the writings on the wall that they're just going to have to shift their thinking and start talking about them as potential customers rather than offenders of some way, because especially because of the point you just made that how many of them might be breaking laws that they don't even know about when all they're trying to do is be a customer? The mainstream adoption of piracy, I mean, we've seen it before. We saw it with Napster where people are using Napster and having no idea what was going on there, the historical magnitude of it or the technology behind it. And then same thing with BitTorrent when that sort of all started. With this device, it makes it so simple. And we're going to see more and more of these devices that will just jack straight into these pirate streams of content, these boards that are just loaded up with with content and anyone in their right mind would take what's available to them, especially when their other options are so limited. I'm reminded of a conversation I had with a friend of mine, must be getting on 15 years ago now, who was a rising junior media executive at the time and is now a very senior media executive. If he's listening, he'll know exactly who I'm talking about. I think he was working for a Murdoch control company at the time. And he said to me that the future of media was that they would make life harder and harder for pirates, push it further and further underground, make it more and more illegal, tougher and tougher to do. So it required more and more knowledge while providing easy and easier, more and more dumbed down legal solutions. And I think that's happened. You know, Netflix, Prime TV, they're super easy to use. They're very convenient. They're pretty cheap. But the other part of his formula is completely not worked out. There is a beautiful walled garden, but things are pretty cool outside the walled garden as well. I think life is generally getting easier for pirates, even as these crazy fines are getting bigger. And even as the hyperbole and rhetoric about piracy is getting stronger. Seems to me like things like this really, as you're saying, Ryan, are spelling great difficulties for the copyright industry looking at a copy restriction model of business. So moving on to the second story, which I think is quite amusing, the Hive CM8 group behind the controversial leaks of the Oscars screeners. It had leaked a series of screeners for the Oscars, as seems to happen each year. One of the screeners was for The Hateful Eight, which I assume this group must have quite enjoyed because after releasing it and getting millions of downloads they've now released a statement where they say 
that they never intended to hurt anyone, presumably Tarantino being the main person they feel they might have hurt, and justifying the leak based on having given away free marketing publicity for the film, which they now believe has given it a higher profile than Star Wars. What's your take on this story, Ryan? It just reminds me of this situation that tends to happen a lot with pirated films, especially. It reminds me of that action film with Sylvester Stallone and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger and like 20 other action stars. The Expendables. There you go. When that film came out, the box office sales were just abysmal. They were horrible. And it, it was something that had been leaked in the pirate boards weeks beforehand. In that situation, you can look at it and say, well, people saw it at home, saw that it was garbage and didn't want to spend any money on it. In the case of this film, clearly the people who leaked it loved the film. I'm sure that a bunch of other people did. And I know film fans, they'll go to see a movie over and over again for the, for the theater experience. People will go watch these films after they see the leaked version. And I think this is a great example of that happening. It used to be that the industry just kind of knew that if they spend $20 million on a movie, they will make their money back. They'll make 50 or $60 million back. But really, in the past couple of years, they've discovered that there's really no floor, that audiences are a lot more discerning. They'll either see a movie that is good in very high, high, high numbers or completely ignore movies that are bad. Only five movies last year, five studio films, made 20% of all of Hollywood's money last year. And as a result of the combination of people being able to crowd share what they think about things with Rotten Tomatoes and stuff, and also these leaks being out, people are able to actually find out, is this worth going to support the filmmakers? And I love that they specifically ask them to. They say, hey, if you want to support this movie, the only way that these filmmakers are going to make more movies is if they earn money. So we put this out so that the people who are too poor to be able to afford to do so will still have an opportunity because they're such great movies. But we really think if you want to support this artist, you should go out and spend your money to do so. They're very clear that they know that they have a big impact on the world. Yes, it's huge free marketing and it can save a movie that's doing poorly because it was badly marketed because it gets out on the internet and it creates a great deal of buzz or it can destroy a movie that's terrible and just show people no you don't want to spend any money on this and i think what's great about that is it means that there's a lot more room in people's kind of uh, consumption patterns for more independent content like we don't have to just stick to the few crappy movies that hollywood puts out we can see the, the the good ones that they put out and then actually have room in our world to see all of the amazing independent films that aren't being seen right now. Yeah, I hear that. What interests me about this Hive CMA statement is that they're acting in this sort of statesman-like way. They know that they've had a global impact and they must be taking some kind of pleasure in that, I would have thought. <laughs> but at the same time, there's this kind of noble quality to it where they know that they've got this international impact and they're making an international statement. These are not ratty cameras. These are people who know the scale they're operating on. It must be quite infuriating I would have thought for the studios. Is there ever going to be a time when studios are going to prevent these kinds of mass leaks? No. Definitely not. Definitely not. When it comes to video and audio, there is no level of DRM that you can apply to something that prevents it from being able to be pirated. As long as it's available, it will be able to be pirated. It will be copied. The internet is the most efficient copy machine on the planet. It will get copied. One of the guys from Popcorn Time that I was talking to a while ago made the really interesting statement that these types of leaks and distribution via pirate networks is good for America, Inc., you know, the U.S. Inc., because it helps with the export of their ideology through movies. And that if it wasn't for these leaks and pirate networks, that, you know, countries like Argentina, South America would consume their own content <laughs> and not get hooked on the United States idea of... I wouldn't call that a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it was a pretty interesting perspective. The last story is about the Chinese cracking group, 3DM. The group has been mostly focused on cracking and translating hentai games, these porn anime games. The founder is called variously Bird Sister, Su Fei Fei and Phoenix. She's actually done half a year in jail for copyright infringement in China and came back out and carried straight on running 3DM and is now doing a blog as well and a video podcast. She's put out a warning that in two years there might not be any more pirated games for people to play because while they were capable 
of cracking encryption systems a couple of years back pretty swiftly, the obfuscation methods and the various security methods employed are getting more complex, are getting better, and they're falling behind and are complaining that they're finding it difficult to hack Just Cause 3, which I understand is a pretty popular game people are wanting to play. What's your take on this, Ryan? In time, it will get cracked. Having the game right now might just not be in the cards for some people, and you might have to go out and buy it. I do have hope that these technologies will get cracked in time because it is very important to new game developers. People who want to learn how to write games and create games often start by modding games, and that won't be possible if they can put this tamper-resistant de novo on it. There's a new version coming out every year, so they're going to keep pushing forward to have new protection mechanisms at just the same rate that the crackers are pushing forward to get it broken. That's interesting. So you're saying that defeating encryption systems like De Nuvo and getting to the code, adding mods, is actually the start point of innovation in games production for a lot of people. Yes, I think it's very important in finding new developers and young developers who don't even know that they want to write code necessarily. They start by playing video games and they'll see something that they want to change and they can go in and they can change it. Counter-Strike was a big thing for that. A lot of the massive online role-playing games are really big for that. It gets young developers in writing code, playing with something that they can see and feel and change, and then ultimately potentially even make some money through reverse engineering. So kind of like a negative externality of improved encryption systems is you decrease the amount of innovation from young developers. Their model is very similar to why like the the movie industry was doing so well in the 80s and 90s, because they have one place where you can go get this piece of content when it's of most value to you, when it hasn't been spoiled and everything else. If they just cause a one or two or three month delay, it's going to cause a lot of people to not want to wait because the game for a lot of gamers is is most valuable in their first playthrough of the entire thing when they're first discovering all of the different things to discover and three four months after it's come out you've probably already gone and played it out at a buddy's house or now that like watching someone play video games online is is a popular thing you've seen how it works etc so like they're really enjoying like this high time i mean they're as big of an industry as the movie or music industry at this point this probably wouldn't be a very popular thing to say with a lot of BitTorrent fans but it'd be kind of cool if it was just like for three months it's definitely uncrackable and then after that it sort of goes into the public domain so if you want to play it in those three months before you've seen all the spoilers and what have you then you pay for it I think there's a lot of value in that concept I, like for example like to try to watch a TV show right now I could watch it the next day on iTunes for three or four bucks. They're trying to say that it's worth three or four bucks to me, and it would be worth that much if I was watching it at the exact same time that everyone is watching it on TV. When it hasn't been spoiled for me, it's as new as it could possibly get. But then by the next day, it's worth considerably, considerably less. And in fact, the reality of the world is it becomes worth zero because you can get it for free online. And I think the exact same concept will apply to things like video games, where it's 40 or 50 bucks to get it in the first couple of months. And three months later, it becomes basically free or maybe it's a dollar. I think that's exactly what you see happening on Steam. If you hang around and you pay attention to the Reddit sub forums for game deals, basically everything gets massively discounted within a three month period you're going to start seeing things offered at half price, even at AAA games. Well, you can see that someone will watch a movie on their laptop or at their home, and then maybe they want to go see it in 3D. They want to get, I mean, especially Star Wars, you see a cam copy on your computer at home, you're going to want to see the IMAX production in 3D and all of that. I'm curious how that actually pans over into the game industry. I mean, it's so easy to get wrapped up into a game and you play the whole thing before you realize, oh, I should have given this developer some money. It's not really something that you can get a good metric on because if you ask someone when they bought a game, have you pirated this before? No one's going to give you an honest answer. And if you ask someone after they pirate something, are you going to go buy this? You're going to have the same problem. You're not going to get honesty on either side. But I think what maybe what they do do is they play a pirated version and then acquire it, a Steam license for it later when it's gone from being $40 to $10. I think the industry does probably get some of the money back. Those people were probably never in the market to pay, you know, $40. Moving on to your project, the Distributed Library of Alexandria. Tell us about what the Alexandria project is. For you, Ryan, you've described very succinctly what it does. 
based on peer-to-peer, allows publishing across a peer-to-peer network and uses Bitcoin to give people a way to pay for content. Can you describe what is the problem that Alexandria Project is solving? I kind of look at it from a perspective of the internet tools that we have right now that are working for media sharing. The real problem that Alexandria is solving is this funnel approach at distributing media where everything has to come from one server and go to every individual source and the lack of payments on on more efficient communications protocols. One possible solution is like with BitTorrent, there's no monetization options there. At the same time, you have centralized indexes in the forms of these websites that display the trackers and the magnet links. We kind of started by approaching it as a way to potentially monetize and at the same time create a distributed index of BitTorrent files, files on the BitTorrent DHT. And give an opportunity for a transaction from fan directly to publisher. It allows fans to pay artists directly. We very quickly learned about IPFS, which is just another DHT. It's like BitTorrent. It seems to be much faster and full featured. So we really picked it because it worked better. When you kind of need to bootstrap a file, like when there's only the, the originator of the file, it's usually very difficult for the first few people to download from them. And even when there's just one originator and one person getting it with IPFS, it's super fast. From just publishing the file out there, it, it works better right away. And it's open source and we know the devs, et cetera. And the fact that it's not full of pirated content was another little thing on the list that helped us go, yeah, this is a good idea. Could you just talk me through how would a content creator go about uploading something? What are the steps? It's a very simple drag and drop interface. It would be just like uploading to YouTube or SoundCloud. As far as the user is involved, the only difference for them really is that they would have to spend some money and it's primarily an anti-spam measure. And it's not actually money that's going to some company or to us specifically. It's literally the cost of putting the information into the indelible database that will exist on the internet. So if they're giving something away for free, where they're saying, here's a thing that you can have absolutely for free with no paywalls, and you can choose to send me tips if you want to, but there's no required cost to you to get it, then their publishing cost is just like a blockchain tipping fee, which is fractions of a penny, very, very, very small. If they choose to sell it, then their publishing price will be the purchase price. So if it's a $5 movie, it'll cost them $5 to publish it. And that's a one-off fee. Yes. What am I purchasing for that fee? You're basically purchasing that it will be there forever, that that data will be in that blockchain because the way that a blockchain works is that data can be added to it, but it can never be removed. The majority of that money is actually going to contribute to the security of that blockchain so that it will exist forever. So basically that's what you're paying is you're paying the miners that are driving the security level of that data up so that it's nice and secure. So Devin, just walk me through me as a creator. So let's say I want to add, steal this show to Alex. Alexandria for people to be able to download it there. What are the benefits to me beyond publishing it through our website? The biggest benefit is really the fact that your website and anyone's website and every single media distribution system out there relies on central points of failure that can be intentionally or unintentionally manipulated. It's a very, very big deal when it comes to kind of truth media. And because all media is controlled by just a few companies, it's incredibly easy to do. Let's look at the example of Turkey. A couple of years ago, a really, really embarrassing leaked audio came out that very much could have seen Prime Minister Erdogan overthrown by his people. But instead, he decided to use the central points of failure of media distribution, the fact that Twitter and YouTube rely on DNS, and he took them down in his country. And so no one got access to this stuff. And since that time, we've seen tons of stories about how he relies on censorship, how he executes journalists, etc. So we've got this guy that's pretty much a really evil dude who would not likely be in power right now if he wasn't able to so simply censor information. If his people had access to information that got out around the world, uh, at the time, he probably wouldn't still be in power. Our mission with Alexandria is kind of twofold in that way, in that we're trying to create a system that works as best as possible for podcast creators and musicians and independent artists and stuff like that to solve as many of the problems that they run into right now so that they can directly connect with their audiences, get monetization directly from their audiences and make sure that no one is censoring or altering or, or shutting down their video because it has a recording of some audio in the background or something just obscure and silly like that. But also as a side effect, we also know that it creates this platform where anyone can share something really controversial and scary and know that they don't run the risk of censorship. It's very difficult or impossible for anyone to take it down. Impossible. Impossible. And it's impossible because even you as the owners or people who are running the Alexandria project, you can't take the content down or? Correct. You can't take it down. We cannot. 
And once the link to the hash that represents that file within IPFS is stored in the blockchain, then not only is that always there on the blockchain, but as long as it's just one, Anywhere on the internet, IPFS node that has it, it's available. If the content was not politically sensitive, but was sensitive in terms of being infringing material, if you received a DMCA takedown notice, you wouldn't then be able to take the media off the net. Once it's on IPFS nodes, it can't be removed. We can remove it from our front end. The blockchain stores the index, so no one owns or controls that information. The index of the library itself belongs to the world because it is a blockchain, and we cannot prevent someone from putting information into it. We also cannot take information out of it. All of us share a single index, and then the idea is that there will be multiple competing front ends to view the content on that use different rules to decide which content inside of the index they want to watch. So we will always stay in control of our app, the way that the index is shown to people, but the content in the index, we are not currently and we will never be in control of. But there's nothing to stop someone from making their own front end that does show those things. Yes. Right, or does show copyright infringing films. Yep. Yep, that's the nature of technology. If I was uploading sensitive leaks or infringing content and I don't want anyone to know who I am, my IP address, is there anonymity baked into the Alexandria library or how do you handle that? Not yet. There is no anonymity in, um, baked into it because of the way that the cryptocurrency transaction goes when you publish something. So when someone publishes something specifically to Alexandria, that transaction can be pointed back to an IP address. Of course, there are a lot of different ways nowadays to change your IP address via VPNs and Tor and things like that. You can hide your own IP address, but out of the box, at least at first, there isn't any anonymity involved in the publishing of it. Is that something that you're planning to provide or, or because that would seem to be very useful for people? Oh, yes. It, it is. It's been in our conversation since day one. I'm a really big fan of Tor. I'm a really big fan of a lot of the online activism that's happening and a lot of the fight for free speech of journalists around the world that's going on. And I would like to see Alexandria be a tool for them, something that they can use. So from the point of view of the user, the non-creator, although of course systems like Alexandria are breaking down that distinction between producer, distributor and consumer, from the perspective of someone who arrives at Alexandria and wants to see what's available, pay for a couple of things, listen to steal this show, how easy will it be and what are the steps that they have to go well, through? Well, it's very easy to get there. You can actually access it right now by going to alexandria.media and this is a hosted version of the browser application, but you can download the code from GitHub, you can put it on your own web server, you can go to dloa.net and you can download the browser application, which you just double click on and it loads the browser up immediately. And at that point, you're faced with something that's very familiar to anyone who browses the web. It's basically a searchable and browsable list of media. It's like the Pirate Bay, but prettier. And Devon, you're obviously very passionate about this project. You mentioned at the start that your time as a marine had informed some of your thinking about media. How do you see Alexandria politically and how is it related to your past experiences? Learning in my late 20s that a really important and significant part of my life, these couple of years that I spent in the Marine Corps, where I joined to be a reservist to go to school right before 9-11. By the time I'm actually in the military and have a contract, suddenly 9-11 has happened. And so I got activated. I invaded Iraq. I went and kind of contributed to the fight in the global war on terror in the Horn of Africa. And so finding out only after I got out of the military that not only was my invasion of Iraq um, and the entire global war on terror based on lies, but the truth was out there. It was available before I went and I didn't know about it and barely anyone knew about it simply because 90% of media is controlled by six companies. And so in order for humans to have access to the media that they need in order to make smart decisions about things that just affect them and their family or their local community or the whole world, like invading another country that might 12 years later lead to the creation of a, a new threat for your country, etc. You need to have access to information and it needs to be big enough that it can actually compete for eyeball space with those six companies that are controlling 90% of the information as well. And so we need to have something that is both compelling, competitive, is creating enough monetization for the artists involved that they really support it and prefer it over the alternatives, that it can break into that and that it can kind of shake up that dominance and control over the narrative and people can start actually making informed decisions. 
And so you see Alexandria Project, IPFS, as providing infrastructure for those visions of the future. And so given those kinds of situations, it's urgent that we have channels where people can communicate the truth and where that truth cannot be censored. And if I understand you correctly, you're saying there's a continuum from musicians, filmmakers, from fiction through to documentary, from creative visions through to renderings of the truth as people see it in terms of people getting access to really what's going on in the world, being able to make decisions about things that affect democracy, the social contract. Well, guys, thanks very much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us on. Thanks a lot for having us, Jamie. It was a real pleasure. Really a delight to talk to you both, and I I wish you the best of luck with the project. Tell us your URLs again that people can come and visit. You can actually see Alexandria itself at alexandria.media. That's a a gateway to the library itself. And you can download the app, and you can read about it at dloa.net. And we're going to post the link to the Steal This Show episode on Alexandria as soon as we can. You've been listening to Steal This Show. Visit us at stealthisshow.com where you can subscribe on iTunes and Android. Get involved with the project. Drop me an email, jamie at stealthisshow.com. Original music was by David Triana. Editing and mixing by Eric Boothilla. The stories we discussed were courtesy torrentfreak.com. Thanks for listening. We'll be back soon. <laughs>